Welcome to my gallery and thank you to our three protagonists for uh, coming together here tonight to discuss uh, their work in uh, relation to contemporary painting. Uh, we want to thank you particularly uh, Art Review for sponsoring uh, this, uh, uh, this event and filming it. Uh, now I open the debate to Um, I think one of the reasons the three of us are sitting here is that we have known each other for a very long time. Um, I don't know how many years ago, so 10, 20 years ago. Um, and so there's been a continual debate between the three of us um, about each other's work, and it's a continual discussion. And I think one of the things we wanted to do today was to basically figure out where we're up to now. And obviously, this whole thing is based around the fact that Mike's shows on the moment. But we wanted to discuss, sort of, um, after the last 20 years, where we've ended up, and possibly where contemporary art has ended up, particularly contemporary painting, and where we fit into contemporary painting. Um, so, um, I think maybe one of the notions that Mike's had for quite some time is, is the idea of abstraction. Um, I wouldn't call these works absolutely abstract, but I would say that the basis of them is abstract painting and the history that, that sort of they want to play with is abstract painting. So um, I suppose the first thing is to just ask Mike uh, how he sees himself in relation to um, the history of abstract painting and where, where he wants, where he sees his work is fitting into it. That's a very good question, but it is. I will, I will try and narrow it down. Um, can you run him, by the way? Is it too, is it too loud? Is it too loud? Is it too loud? Is it too loud? Should we close it? Yeah, we can be out of the way. Whatsoever, 
and the whole this nature doing its thing with A. While at the other end, I will make paintings that are abstract that are completely mathematically controlled. So I'm, mine's more of a kind of a experiment with the parameters of what what constitutes abstraction and realism. And would you call that chance, or I just Nature. call it the world doing its thing? So, so the label abstraction is kind of the label that's put on it because it's not figurative or hermetically copying nature, but it it is nature. So it's kind of uh, it's a, I don't like it abstract really. I, I don't define it as that, but I do think about it in terms of the history of painting because that's the thing that it draws from, it gives it meaning. Yeah, I mean, as you yeah. said, sort of like Pollock, there's, there's a certain extent that one to rely upon chance, even if his body sort of gets in the way of the chance and sort of it's the way his body might move. Um, so what, how would you relate the chance um, events um, yeah, to affect your painting? I think, I think it's a mixture of what Keith is saying. I think there's two kind of areas, those two areas of difference come together in that, that when I'm making the paintings, they're, um, there's both control and chance happening at the same time. So for example, there's a lot of pouring in the painting. When I tip the painting, the paint kind of goes where it goes. But then of course there are these very um, distinct pop signs that, um, that, are, that, are, that are kind of embedded within those pores. Um, and at the same time, as, as well as on top of that, you get this kind of so much layering that chance occurs because because you don't, I don't actually know what I'm painting from one day to the next because there's so many stickers on the, on the paintings. So you're kind of, you're kind of, you're taking a risk every time you're covering over something. And then what you end up with don't actually, is, is often a surprise. So there's, there's an extra element of chance. In a sense. Would you say that one of the reasons both of you want to use chance is that you want a certain sense of the sublime in your work? Which obviously is the sublime is quite a big element in, in abstract painting, you could say. I know it is sublime. Something maybe bigger than yourself. I think I think I would switch the term. I think I think I'd switch the term. I'd say something like what well, I don't make you think, but I certainly want paintings to feel so. The way you make you know, you want it to kind of be, it is something that is beyond you. You make it in the studio that goes into the world and you know, people respond to it. Um, whether that's a sublime feeling, I have no idea. But I think it's, for me, what's, what's interesting is that somebody may take something or feel something from the painting that maybe you couldn't necessarily express through verbal language, for example, or through uh, a kind of illustration in a magazine, or something on the internet. <coughs> Both of you make very big paintings as well. I mean, that, that, that maybe goes back to the sublime as well. I mean, sort of like... You've made the odd big one. What? You've made the odd big one. I have, but um, I'm maybe not sort of like... I'm trying to get back to sort of, you know, big, uh, abstract work. Yeah. It's sort of... that involves a certain degree of chance. Um, that uses, that, that again, certainly uses the, the model of um, abstract expressionism. Again, sort of like you, both of you have made work on the floor, which then dries and then you put it on the wall. Um, why has that process been so interesting for both of you? I think, it, it, for me, this, you know, we talk about chance, but chance really is, um, is just the unpredictable. And so it's, you know, why does anyone make a painting full stop? And there's a dialogue between you and this thing, this process that you engage with. And it informs you as much as you inform it. There's this, there's this constant conversation going on with this thing that's manifested in front of you. Some of which is under your control, and a lot of which isn't under your control. By painting them, you know, if we put a painting on the wall and, and gravity does its stuff and the drips go down, there's all these things go on. Well, if you put it on the horizontal and let the thing move around, it's, I see it more like a, a kind of atmosphere, an infra-thin atmosphere of clouds rising and falling. And in that space, there are, it's like a three-dimensional sculpture on the surface. And that's the reason I go that way around. It's kind of like producing a sculpture on the surface of a painting in the same way that the clouds rise and the seas move. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to create the most kind of rich um, environment for myself to have a dialogue with the work, even though I'm not there's still some control, as in the 
like the primordial sort of goo, sort of creating some. Yeah, and yet they, thing. you know, it's hard to give them uh, assistance, like a bucket, and ask them to do it, and they can't do it because they try to control the thing, they try to mimic a, a picture. So I don't know, like yours have a lot more um, structural parentheses in which that happens, but there's still this kind of noise and surprise and this dialogue that you're having with the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'd, I'd just like to frame this a bit, a bit, a bit differently. I mean, I think that you know, I'm working quite clearly working within a very particular framework, and yeah. that framework comes out of abstraction, mm -hmm. history of yeah, abstraction right. and contemporary abstraction. And that framework um, is, is, uh, is, is, is bound by certain kind of conventions, which of course we play around with. And you know, so for me, what 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 I I try to do is I, I think what you're talking about is, a, is how to create form in painting or formalism, mm -hmm. which of course is a trait of abstract expressionism. But of course, as we both know, formalism in and of itself is a very redundant. Uh, Uh, genre. If, if it's just if it's just if you're just making an abstract painting to be a formalist painting, for me it just becomes like decoration or a pattern. Yeah. So you know, so the cuts so the so the, so the, so the Well, I think we were just we were talking about the sort of like the way we actually go about the way you go about making a painting, and it did strike me that, that you had quite quite a similar process to a large degree. But both of you have conceptual structures which hold it all together, which I think do stop it being purely formalist. Um, you don't just want to make necessarily a beautiful object just for its own sake. You're trying to say something more than that. Um, try and be critical to that idea that, that you, you can just make something beautiful end of, end of story. You're doing, you're doing something similar, obviously. And I, I'd be very curious to know what you, what, what, how you frame that. Yeah, I think I mean I think I always try and undermine beauty to some extent. So sort of like you want to make something which has sublime elements to it, um, which is gorgeous. I mean, sort of like clouds rising and falling, um, and layers, and this sort of like misty um, event which you can escape into on the canvas. But then you want to have something which actually says no, stop. This is a um, it's a mistake just to believe in that uh, art can be escapist and art can have these huge ideals and art can be gold. Um, I always try and undermine that by saying, no, this is a flat surface, we're just playing a game, it has this particular history, all these, um, has a language which stops us and controls us and makes us see things in particular ways. Well, you know, your, your work has a critical outlook, it? It, it? it looks at something, it takes an image from the past, and kind of doesn't believe what that image tells you don't believe what that image is supposed to tell us and that's why you choose to show us the image through the reproduction. You know, it's almost like you're you're questioning the kind of values of history, art history, and that you you're saying that because we see them through reproduction, the values that people kind of give to the kind of unique single object are actually kind of stupid. And then you're kind of you're kind of um, your, 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 you know, through reproduction, copying through a re from a reproduction is a kind of it's kind of downgrading the idea of some wonderful, sublime, unique object. Well, so the I mean, the idea of the brush stroke obviously comes into it. Um, it's a sort of like I always try and undermine the idea that the that brush stroke um, has any fantastic meaning to it. That it really is. It's just a cliche. And it's an interesting cliche, and it has um, interesting relationships to the way the body moves. But it became people became so hung up by it um, in your in, work. In just you know, people in, in in modernist painting, people became so obsessed with the brush mark that it was became comic. 